So we are beginning a new series entitled Right Before Revelation. Now, let me explain what this series is not. This is not an end times series. Uh, we are not looking at the events uh, that fulfill things described or leading up to Revelation. Uh, I know that may disappoint some of us because we'd love to speculate about end times. However, this series is really important because we're going to go through the books that appear right before Revelation in our Bibles, specifically 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, these three books are often passed over, especially when compared to the attention Revelation gets. Yet 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are written by the Apostle John, the same apostle who wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, he also wrote the Gospel of John. And um, we are fascinated with Revelation because of end time stuff. But the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were instructions to the church for the current time. And we often have our focus on what will happen in the end. And the books right before Revelation direct our focus on the here and now. So what did John have to say to the church in his day? Because that can guide us in ours. We often think that the New Testament church was somehow in some way this ideal church. It was how the church should always be. You know, where everyone loved Jesus and got along perfectly uh, there were never any problems in the early church. Well, that's not true. The early church was never ideal. Uh, like today, the early church faced all kinds of challenges. At the time of the writing of these letters from the Apostle John, a heresy had already crept into the church, and much of John's letters are a response to this heresy. Now, the heresy would come to be known as something called Gnosticism. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details of this particular false teaching, but I do want to give three quick highlights of Gnosticism. First of all, one thing that the Gnostics believed was that the spirit was good and material stuff is bad. And there are some remnants of this thinking even today where we think, well, hey, we need to overcome the material world with spiritual maturity. Well, biblically, this is wrong, because when God created the material world, God called it good. Now, sin has corrupted both the spiritual and the material, but that doesn't mean that the material is bad. Um, a second tenet of Gnosticism was that the divine did not actually come in the flesh, since they believed that the material was bad and the spiritual was good, while the divine nature of Jesus would never ever become human. And so what they taught was that Jesus appeared to be human, but he really wasn't. He just looked human. And then the last point uh, that I want to make from them is that for the Gnostics, knowledge mattered. Morality didn't. For the Gnostics, the mark of a mature believer was one who had special knowledge. You know, following the commands of God, nah, that really wasn't that important. It was all about knowledge. And so while Gnosticism isn't a huge issue for today's church, there are things that John says to the church in response to it that are still vital for us to remember today. Uh, the scripture for today is 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to read through the end of chapter 1 into chapter 2, uh, to the second verse of chapter 2. Uh, as you saw in the bumper video, 1 John is just a couple of pages before Revelation. So Re Revelation is the last book in the Bible. If you turn to the very last book and then just turn a few pages before it, you're going to see and find 1 John. Uh, you can also look up 1 John on your phones if you would like. Our scripture reader for this morning is Kevin Stellingworth. And so, Kevin, go ahead and make your way onto the podium. As he does, I'm going to ask you if you're able, please stand and face the center of the room. Um, we stand because we believe this is the Word of God, and we read from the center of the room to remind us that Scripture is to be central in our lives. And so, Kevin, whenever you are ready, please read 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2. 
That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out of the truth. But if we walk in the light as he, in, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we, ha we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice from our sins, and not only for our, but also for the sins of the whole world. Kevin, thank you very much. You may be seated. Now, a word that got repeated four times in that passage is the word fellowship. Now, fellowship is kind of a churchy word. It gets thrown around in church circles um, all the time. But what does it actually mean? Uh, many of us are familiar with J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy. And the first of those books is called The Fellowship of the Ring. What, what does that mean? What does Fellowship of the Ring mean? And I've always been kind of confused by that title. So I looked it up, <laughs> and it's really quite simple. Um, in the trilogy, The Ring of Power needs to be destroyed. And so a group of characters come together to accomplish that task. And so the ring gave them a common purpose. And that common purpose gave them relationships with each other. It bound them together. And there are a lot of things that can bind us together. Politics can bind us together, sports, military service, where we live, hobbies, movies. In colleges, they have things called fraternities. Fraternities are simply brotherhoods formed around common goals. Sororities are sisterhoods formed around common goals. Almost anything can be the basis for a fellowship. For one semester in college, I was a part of the chess club, and we met weekly mainly to play chess. Now, some guys met and talked about chess strategies. I just showed up to play. Now, I probably should have listened to some of those strategy talks because my record in the chess club for that semester was one win and 29 losses. I once played against a guy who was blind and I had to verbally tell him what the moves were. Not only did he beat me, but halfway in the match, he started a second game against somebody else. He beat me, he beat the other guy. He was pretty good. The guys in the chess club, they took chess really seriously and they were really good at it. I only participated for one semester because I was not that serious. I just wanted to go play. So I didn't really belong with these guys. Well, that's what a fellowship is. It's something that binds you together, brings you together. It's something that you have a commonality around. And for John, the church was a fellowship. It was a faith fraternity. And every fellowship has a common bond, something that every person in that fellowship is connected to. Every fellowship has a foundation. 
And John begins his letter with that foundation, going back to verse 1, where it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you will also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and we write this to make our joy complete. The foundation is that Jesus, the Son of God, came in the flesh. Now, the Gnostics claimed that he just appeared to be human. But John says, we have seen with our own eyes. We have heard. Our hands have touched. The word of life, the Son of God, coming in the flesh was real. He didn't just seem to be human. He was human. Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection is the foundation of the fellowship. It is what binds us together. Now, some people, they like Jesus' teachings, and some like his concerns for the poor and the oppressed, and some appreciate Jesus' ethics. And while all those things matter and are important, that was not foundational to John. The fellowship started when the Word of God came in the flesh. He actually lived among us. As John wrote in his Gospel, in chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Son who came from the Father, he dwelt among us. And so for John, when Jesus healed the sick or the blind or the deaf, that was real. Or when Jesus walked on water, that was real. Or when Jesus rose the little girl from the dead, that was real. Or when Jesus was arrested, that was real. Or when Jesus was beaten, that was real. Or when Jesus was crucified, that was real. Or when Jesus rose from the dead, that was real. John saw it with his own eyes. John heard Jesus with his own ears. John touched Jesus with his own hands. For John, this wasn't a fantasy. For John, this wasn't some pie-in-the-sky dream. For John, it was real. Which is what we remind ourselves every week. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. It is real. It actually happened. It is the foundation of our faith. It is the foundation of our fellowship. And John says, don't let anyone tell you differently. This is the foundation of our fellowship in Jesus. And it's not just a fellowship about the Father and the Son. It's a fellowship with the Father and the Son. And to be a part of that, we must believe that the Son of God, the Word of God, became flesh and lived among us. So the foundation of our fellowship comes from believing that Jesus' life and death and resurrection was real. But being a part of that fellowship does involve more. 
Being in the fellowship of Jesus includes faithful living. The fellowship of Jesus changes how we live. Going back to the passage, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. God is light. In him there is no darkness. So if we are going to have fellowship with God, well then we are going to walk in the light. Being a part of the fellowship of Jesus changes how we live. Now, we are saved by faith, not works. Salvation is a gift from God that we do not earn. However, that doesn't mean that our faith in Jesus has no impact on our morality or how we live. That was one of the mistakes the Gnostics made. They thought all they had to do was claim some kind of special knowledge. And they thought it didn't matter how they lived. Well, they were wrong. Now, good works are not the cause of our salvation. Our faith is the cause of our salvation. But again, that doesn't mean good works have nothing to do with our faith. Good works are the result of our faith. The same faith that leads me to believe in Jesus is the same faith that causes me to live like Jesus. Those aren't two separate things. It's the same faith. As it says in James chapter 2, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. The point of the message here is pretty clear. Or the passage. The point of it is, you cannot show your faith without deeds. Think about it. If I were to ask you to demonstrate your faith in Jesus to me, and don't do it by doing anything, <laughs> how are you going to do that? It's impossible. In order to demonstrate your faith, you have to do something. Now, deeds are not the cause of faith. They are the result of it. Now, going back to 1 John, the passage also says that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another, meaning we all have the same goal, to walk in the light as he is in the light. We are all on the same team. Now, if I were to claim that I'm on a softball team, but I never go to practice, and I never go to a game, I never play in a game, don't make any of the practices, I never do anything related to being on the team. Well then, I'm not on the team. It's quite simple. It doesn't matter what I say. If I never practice or if I never play, then I'm not on the team. Look, if we claim that we are followers of Jesus and then we don't do anything to actually follow him, then we're not followers of Jesus. Here is an amazing revelation. If you're a note taker, write this down because you're going to be blown away by this. Followers of Jesus follow Jesus. Pretty radical concept, huh? Walking in the light is a key part of the fellowship of Jesus. So there's a fellowship foundation, there's faithful living, and a third marker of being a part of the faith fraternity is forgiveness. Going back to the passage, 
one more time. Verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Two things to point out here. First is the importance of confession. The passage says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. If we claim to be without sin, we make God out to be a liar. M. Scott Peck was a 20th century American psychiatrist. And as a psychiatrist, he attempted something that I find remarkable. He wanted to try to come up with a psychological definition of evil. Now, he never intended to have the APA adopted or anything like that. He just wanted to see that if he could describe evil from a psychological perspective, and here is what he came up with. Evil is the inability or unwillingness to admit your shortcomings. Evil is the inability or unwillingness to admit your shortcomings. Not, he doesn't say, it's the inability or unwillingness to fix them. It's just to admit you have them. And before you think, wow, that's really odd. That doesn't make any sense at all. Well, let me ask you this. If you live in sin, and you do all sorts of evil things, and yet you're never willing to say, that's wrong, you're going to keep doing it, completely oblivious to all the harm you are causing. Because you will have an excuse for how all the bad things you cause are not your fault, which will lead to all sorts of evil. It actually makes a lot of sense. Now, for M. Scott Peck, and I would also argue Scripture, when it talks about confession, it's not talking about generic confessions. You know, things like, you know, I'm not perfect, and we all make mistakes, well, that's true, but those aren't confessions. They sound like confessions, but they're really not confessions. How about being able to admit something specific that you did wrong? Because that's what confession is. You know, sort of like, hey, you know, when I kicked the wall out of anger, I was wrong. Or when I lied to you about where I was going, I was wrong. Or when I made fun of you, when you made that mistake, I was wrong. If we can't do that, <laughs> if we can't admit those kinds of things that we do wrong, and you don't make excuses, you don't explain it, you say, you know something, when I did that, that was wrong. If we can't do that, we are in a world of trouble. Because for M. Scott Peck, he called that evil. And the Bible says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's a bad place to be. Now the good news, which is the second point, is if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. We don't have to hide who we are. Trust me, God already knows all of your shortcomings. He knows them all. 
even the ones we work really hard to hide from everybody. He knows them all, and he still loves us. And there is nothing more powerful than someone knowing our deep, dark shortcomings and still loving us. There is nothing more powerful than someone knowing our deep, dark shortcomings and still caring about us. God knows them, and he still loves us. That is good news. And remember, the purpose of forgiveness is not to change the past. Forgiveness does not change the past. Forgiveness changes our future. God forgives us so that we can maintain our fellowship with him. God forgives us so that we can become the people we were meant to be, who God created us to be in the first place. That's what forgiveness is for. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. It is real and it changes everything. And God is always initi initiating fellowship with us. You know, we can go days, weeks, months, years, and not think twice about God. God is always initiating fellowship with us. He doesn't go days and weeks and years not trying to initiate fellowship with us. He is always initiating it. God wants us to be a part of his fellowship. Fel the fellowship of those who follow his son Jesus, the one who came in the flesh, the one who shows us how to walk in the light, the one who forgives us of our sins. Our faith fraternity is the fellowship of life. Please pray with me. And Lord, for that, we are truly grateful. Lord, we thank you for this fellowship you created in your son, that he came, lived, died for our sins, rose from the dead, conquering death. And Lord, we ask that you would help us, encourage us, spur us to walk in the light, to be a part of this fellowship of Jesus where everything we say and everything we do is ultimately for your glory. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.